Here at the University of Birmingham, we have an amazing team of paleontologists from all over the world researching all types of ancient creatures, from the biggest dinosaurs to the smallest microscopic algae. With our friends at the Lapworth Museum, which is just next door to us, we all work together to try and answer important questions, whether that's what the oceans look like in the past or how climate change impacted ancient animals. In these videos, you can meet some of our paleontologists and we hope you learn something cool today. As paleontologists, we aim to solve problems using fossil evidence. At Birmingham, one problem we're tackling is the poorly understood early evolution of the ray-finned fishes. Ray-finned fishes are one of the most successful groups of animals that have ever evolved. Did you know they make up over half of all vertebrate species alive today and have dominated aquatic environments worldwide for almost half a billion years? My name is Struan and I am in my third year as a PhD researcher. My research focuses on the origin and rise to dominance of this group back in the Paleozoic. From their origins way back in the Devonian, in the shadow of big armoured fishes, through a mass extinction and into the Carboniferous, when they became the dominant aquatic group that they are today. And my name is Jake. I'm a second year PhD researcher. And while Struan is approaching the issue from below, looking at the origin in the Paleozoic, I'm sort of approaching the issue from above, looking at what they're doing in the Mesozoic, specifically in the Jurassic. So I study stem teleost fishes, which are the elusive precursor to living teleost fishes, which include 99% of all living ray finned fishes. That's a lot of fishes. So, who are the ray-finned fishes anyway? Well, first things first, you might be quite surprised to hear us say fishes instead of fish. It sounds like we're saying sheeps or mooses. But actually, lots of one species of fish can be called a group of fish, but lots of different species are always called fishes. There are two main groups of vertebrates. On one side, we have the cartilaginous fishes. They are comprised of about 1,000 species of sharks, rays and chimeras. And on the other side, we have the bony fishes. The bony fishes include the lobe-finned fishes, which we usually think of as these ancient fishes like lungfish and coelacanths. But actually, they include a group called the tetrapoda, which includes every land-dwelling vertebrate, including amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Which gets really weird when you think that actually, dolphins and whales are fish, and that so are humans. The other bony fishes are the ray-finned fishes. Even though they are almost as diverse as amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals combined, they just don't get anywhere near as much attention. They include some iconic animals like the polyopterus, paddlefishes, alligator gars, salmon, giant oarfish, moray eels, seahorses, frogfishes, sunfishes, parrotfishes, and uh, mudskippers, which are just... They're just so weird, look at them. Um, yeah, that's a story for another time. How do we work out how fossil fishes are related to living fishes or to each other? Paleontologists are able to reconstruct the relationships between extinct animals by studying their fossilized anatomy, though this is easier said than done. Though sometimes we collect new specimens in the field, we already have a wealth of fossils already available to us in museum collections that are in dire need of more work. In an ideal world, Every fossil would be perfectly preserved with all of its anatomy intact and recognisable. Unfortunately, this is extremely rare. This is because fossils form in a wide range of environments, with some environments preserving their anatomy much better than others. For example, the Gogol Formation in a very remote part of Western Australia has preserved beautiful fossils from a 380 million year old reef. Animals on this reef fell into basins around the reef and sunk into the seafloor very quickly. This, combined with the fact that there was very little oxygen, meant that they decomposed very slowly, leaving some fossils with not just the bones, but the soft tissues as well. There is even a fossil with an adult and juvenile fish still attached by the umbilical cord. And this is another example of an extinct lobefin fish showing the exquisite 3D preservation of the Gogo formation. In contrast, 
in the Baitugan formation of Russia, for example, all we have are a whole bunch of different fish scales. And this, unfortunately, is far more common than the beautiful Gogo formation. So because the odds are so stacked against us, we need to extract as much information as possible out of the fossils that we already have. One way of doing this is to look at the internal anatomy. That's the unseen information on the inside of the fossil. To get at this, you can either smash the fossil to pieces, which unsurprisingly, museums aren't best pleased with you if you do that. So a workaround is to use some incredibly specialized equipment. What Jake and I use is called a CT scanner. Have you ever broken a bone and needed to get an x-ray? Then you've come pretty close to experiencing what our fossil fishes experience. An x-ray machine photographs your skeleton and it lets doctors see your bones through your skin without needing to operate. It works because bones are made of a very different material to your skin, which means it takes longer for the x-rays to travel through them. We think along the same lines. We don't want to risk damaging our fossils, so we scan our fossils with x-rays. So like before, the fossil itself is made out of a different material than the rock that surrounds it. So imagine weirdly that the rock is your skin and the fossil is your bone. For example, this is an extinct fossil fish called Dorsotichthys. As you can see, it's very shiny. That's because its original skeleton and scales have been replaced with a mineral called pyrite, otherwise known as fool's gold. Because the pyrite is so different to the surrounding rock, it's a perfect candidate for our CT scanner. But what's more, we can scan our fossils from multiple angles so that our X-ray scans are in three dimensions. Now this process can take several hours and produces hundreds of different images. Each scan produces a different layer, and then it's up to us to tirelessly go through each scan and separate the bone from the rock. And this can be incredibly difficult if the rock and the fossil look very much the same, or if the fossil has been jumbled up or damaged. But once all of that is done, we have a perfect digital copy of an actual fossil. So this is the skull. If you're a little bit confused, I'll just show you where the mouth and the eyes would go. But what's really great about this is that we can break this apart and dissect it to our heart's content while the real fossil is safe and sound back in the museum. Doing this reveals internal anatomy, like the brain case, the shape of which has been carefully preserved for up to hundreds of millions of years, but still never actually seen before by human eyes. By studying this brain case and comparing it to the brain cases of other fossil fishes, this can often be the missing piece of the puzzle to evolutionary questions that have baffled paleontologists for decades.